Hello and welcome to another episode of the Oxford Online Maths Club. Great to have you with us. Um, we're going to be talking about some maths today, probably this maths that I've got on the board. Um, and I'm going to say quickly hello to people in chat. Who have I seen? I've seen Kai here. Hi to Harriet as well. Um, hi, <laughs> smiley face, someone in chat. Um, hi to Prisma, who's moderating chat again, so that chat messages can appear without me clicking on anything. Um, we've had a chat about uh, precision on numbers. Um, <laughs> why not just why not why number anything at all? Oh look, it's Nikita Mazapin again. Um, right, okay. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. How are you doing, chat? Are you all right? It's weather is incredibly sunny very suddenly in Oxford, um, properly in Oxford, and also that means that in when it's really sunny out here, the uh, the builders start. Um, so there's a huge building site just next to my just next to my office. We're going to find out whether that causes problems or not. Um, I can think of two problems that might happen. Uh, they might make loads of noise uh, that is distracting in the background, and they might cut through an internet cable. Um, so if either of those things happen, then I'm really sorry. Um, cool. OK. Um, uh, Harriet's finished PPEs. I can't remember what that stands for. Protective equipment, right? Um, <laughs> politics, philosophy, and economics? No. Oh no, Jack's got COVID. Oh, I think I think I met Jack. Jack was one of the people I met at an open day. I hope you didn't get COVID from my open day, Jack. Um, Raphael was at the open day too, but didn't say hello. Hi, Raphael. Nice to see you as well. Um, get, oh, Kai's been doing oh, school productions at secondary school. Ah, oh, good times. Um, Pre-public exams. Year 12 mocks. Right, cool. Yeah, get well soon, Jack. I hope you, I hope you don't have it too bad. I hope you get better soon. Oh, these have got likes. This is sorted by likes, not recent. There we go. Recent, there we go. Good, there we go. That's why Prisma's statement was staying at the top for so long. Always forget that one. Um, so this week I've been helping out with a maths program called Unique. Um, I think some people in chat are involved with Unique. I know because I met some of them on the week, Unique week we've just had. Um, it's a sort of summer school that we repeat three times. Um, and I'm also going to steal some content from it to use today. Um, so if you've been on the Unique week this week, uh, you've already seen this um, a bit. Uh, you probably know what I'm going to do. Um, but we didn't actually do all of the work on Unique, so we're going to try and do some of that today. Um, uh, Casey's tired. Sorry, Casey. Uh, so else is currently on vacation. I think that's not the same person, on vacation and tired. Um, ha, okay. Uh, not sure. Da, 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 da. Yeah, as Jack says that two people have got COVID after both coincidentally perhaps being going to the open day. Yeah, cool. If you come to an Oxford Open Day, then it is extremely likely that I'll be around at some point. If you come to the maths department, and if I'm still here, uh, that being one of the things that I do. Uh, oh, Harry was at the Open Day as well. Hi, Harry. Look, people at Open Days. Any unique people? No, I think the unique people have had enough of us for one week. Uh, right, cool. If you're coming to a future unique, then don't worry. This isn't spoilers for future unique weeks. We'll do something else instead. Um, okay, here's how the problem works. Um, I've got on the board here in Desmos, love Desmos, um, a quartic. Um, a quartic is a fancy word for a uh, polynomial of degree 4. The highest power is x to the 4. That's just off the left of the screen there. Let me fix that very briefly because I do want to show you the left of the screen. Um, what's the quickest way to do that? It's probably to shake that slightly, bring it in like this, bring it in like this. There we go. I think that's probably resized it onto the screen. Like that. There we go. There we go. Okay. Give it a little shake. Get it onto the screen. Cool. So now you can see it's a times x to the four plus b times x cubed plus c times x squared plus dx plus e. That's a general quartic expression for the degree four polynomial. Um, and because Desmos is great, you can have these sliders that change the uh, vary that change the values of those coefficients. So you can explore what happens as you change the coefficients in your quartic. That one's maybe. That last one's interesting in a way, isn't it? As things move around. I'm just trying to explore what quartics are like. Um, because I think I want to get better at sketching graphs, right? Curve sketching. Um, curve sketching is quite an important skill. And I figured that if I got better at sketching polynomials, then that would help me get better at graph sketching. So this is kind of the idea what a quartics look like. Um, oh, personal statements for maths versus maths and philosophy. And Prisma's put an answer because Prisma's studying maths and philosophy at Oxford. Um, but of course, they say they're not too sure. Um, yeah, OK. Yeah, punch in succinct, they suggest. Fair enough, I suppose. Cool. 
There's no real roots on my Portic at the moment. I can change it though. Uh, oh, sorry, catching it with chance. Ah, yeah. So this one, there is a Quartic formula for solving for what the roots are. And somebody in chat knows that that's the the best we can do in terms of writing down expressions with radicals for finding roots of polynomials. That's some deep theory about polynomials. I uh, don't think I'm going to go that advanced today. Um, oh, one vote in chat for Desmos. Uh, for Ge GeoGebra, sorry. One vote for GeoGebra, much better than Desmos. Uh, let's have that. Let's have that. Let's work that out. I've been using Desmos a lot. I really like it. Look, can, can GeoGebra do animations like this, where it slides around? Ooh, I don't know, because I have not opened GeoGebra in years. Um, what else is chat saying that I missed? Um, there's also a disadvantage applicants that did not attend the open day. No, of course not. Um, we don't even know who attended the open day. Um, we didn't do a sign-ups or anything like that. Oh, that's, that would be terrible, wouldn't it? Um, no, 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 don't disadvantage people today. We don't, in general, we don't care if you're doing our events in particular or not. Um, do what you like, then we're going to take the best mathematicians. Uh, OOMC was recommended by Parallel Circles. No way! We recommended them. Oh, is this real? Did we actually get a shout out from Simon Singh? Oh, I should be watching their show. I didn't see their show. Their show's not recorded, so you have to watch it live. Um, cool. Uh, I will let them know that this is something that you would like. Uh, cool, right, good. Uh, Somebody's coming on Saturday. See you on Saturday. Cool, right? I've caught up with chat. Sorry to scroll chat up and down on screen. Uh, but how's this going with this uh, poly with this polynomial? I figured maybe I'll just turn on all the sliders and see what happens. And explore different cortex. And then we'll get really good at spotting cortex, right? I'm going to set the speeds to be different speeds. Do people in chat know about um, if I say Lissajou curve? Does that mean anything in chat? Can we talk about that at some point? Lissajou curve. Very quickly. No. Um, some of these cortex are a bit wild. They're going a bit all over the place, aren't they? I'm going to zoom out a bit. Yeah, some of these cortex are a bit much for me. I think A is doing a lot. I'm going to set A to be 1. And just keep it around at 1. There we go. Someone shouted it out. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, but there's, there's a vote for GeoGebra being better than Desmos. We have a thumbs up on it. Uh, yeah, it's like a lava lamp, Casey. Yeah, I, I like it. Like that. It's kind of a lava lamp, but it's not going up and down. It's sort of maybe now that I've set A to be one, it's only coming down from the top. Somehow it looks a little bit like um like the start of James Bond, right? Uh, like Goldeneye, where it's like I don't know, slightly gory, like blood coming down the screen or something awful like that. Goodness me, um, don't know why my mind went there. Terrible. Right, there we go. There's the curve back again. No more James Bond entries for us. Right, cool. Um, so. Something I've noticed is that quartics sometimes have that kind of archetypical quartic shape. Let me try and pause it with what I mean. Oh, I don't love that. It's gone all the way down there. Let's make these numbers less wild. Behave, quartic. Yeah, okay, that's a good quartic. Um, quartics like this, where it's got kind of three turning points, that seems pretty nice. Um, uh, that seems pretty nice. Um, and you can do some algebra, I think, to work out whether your quartic has got three turning points. It sort of feels like it's a little bit slanted to me, like the right-hand one is lower than the left-hand one. There's probably games you can play with that to talk about what the difference between these turning point coordinates is, and where the other one is as well, I suppose. Um, but also something you can do is, maybe if this is sort of slanted, we could draw slanted that way. No. How do I, can, how do I, there we go, slanted that way. Um, then we can uh, maybe draw a line underneath it that shows how slanted it is. Um, which I've got over here. There we go. Okay, so a line that's uh, a line that. Well, maybe what have I done there? Let's put it into into chat as well. Chat is still fighting over which is better. <laughs> Live or let pie. Oh my goodness. Um, there's no threshold math scores for different school types. High as possible. I'd say number. I, I always say that 70 is a good math score. You can look at some statistics on our website if you like. Joe wrote to the power of Desmos equals zero. Please discuss. Ooh. I think they believe that Desmos is 0 0.5 and Joe is zero. Okay, right, anyway. Um, I've thrown in a random blue line. I promise you this has come from somewhere. Can we describe, please, what I've done? Um, I should admit that this problem we're going to work on, this problem is inspired by a problem I saw on Problem Solving Matters, which is a course that we run on a couple of Saturdays in Oxford. 
Um, people come and they solve some problems. They work with our current students to solve some problems. Uh, it's held at different universities around the UK as well. Um, this problem is one of the problems that was uh, on the Problem Solving Matters course last time. Um, and it's also a problem that I've thought about using for a math question. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to use it for a math question now that I've put it on the screen here. Um, yeah. Is it uh, so? KC has described this um, linear function which passes through the two local minimums. It's kind of not quite what I've done. The minimum, the minimum are actually slightly off from the line that I've drawn. Um, Tom says, yeah, this non mat question that I showed Unique, you, th this is the question we're doing. And I think somebody at Unique said you should do this on the maths club. So you did this. Um, I didn't forgot to take your name, but somebody there said, oh goodness, you should, this problem's awful, you should do it on the maths club. So here we are. What's actually going on? Uh, it doesn't quite go through the, the minimums. It's a double tangent. Yes, this, this person. That's what I've done. I found a line that's tangent to the quartic twice. That's the sort of gimmick, right? Um, you can do tangents to a curve for a quadratic, or just a polynomial, you can talk about the tangents. Um, for a cubic, the tangents are quite well behaved, but for quartics, you can do, sometimes, a line that's tangent to the quartic in two places. Yeah, credit. There we go. Oh, is it credit to Tom? That was Tom. Oh, there we go. Hi, Tom. Nice to see you live here. Uh, yeah, everyone blame Tom. Uh, I showed Tom this problem on Unique earlier this week, and Tom said, "You should do this on the club." The discussion actually went. The discussion actually went. Tom asked me, "What are we going to do on Maths Club?" I said, "I don't know." Tom points at the board and says, "You should do that." So here we are. <laughs> um, so something a little bit weirds going on. My formula is quite good. Oh my goodness, why is that going so fast? Oh, because I turned the speed up. <sighs> formula is quite good. It does something slightly weird in some cases. Um, that we might have time to explore later on. Um, I'm going to share this uh, Desmos plots with you at some point. Way down the bottom here, this line y equals alpha x plus beta, I've got some expressions for alpha and beta um, that we're going to try and derive now. Um, when I showed this problem to people on Unique, I described it as pretty evil, and that was in a special case um, with particular numbers in. Um, here, I'm trying to solve it in general, different numbers. Okay, tangent of x degree of polynomial. Um, right, so if you, have a, if you have a different polynomial with a different degree, you can draw the tangents. Um, if you want it to be tangent in multiple places, then you need quite a higher degree polynomial. Um, I think twice as high degree as the number of points where you would like a special tangent to be, uh, a special tangent to be tangent to the in multiple places. So if you, want, if you want to find a curve with a single tangent that's tangent to that curve in three different places, I reckon you need a polynomial of degree six, and they're a bit weird. Um, yeah, 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 okay, so can you differentiate and solve simultaneously? Suggestions in chat from how to solve this. Hi Roy, um, you've missed nothing. I've put a quartic on the board, and I've shown people a line, tantalizingly, I haven't told you how I've calculated this line that's tangent to the quartic in two places. And we've agreed that that seems like the sort of thing that should exist. Um, I think. Have we agreed that? Are there cortex where this line won't exist? Yes, brilliant question. Seems like the sort of thing that should maybe exist. Um, there are cortex where it doesn't exist. Um, x to the 4 is a good example. Let's have a look at x to the 4. That's a nice simple cortex. Um, set all these sliders to 0. Um, x to the 4 is a really simple cortex where... So my line doesn't really work in this case. I've got some formula hiding down here for how this blue line works, but this, is, this line's only actually tangent in one place. And I think it's quite clear that there's no, nowhere to put the blue line that's tangent in two places for this particular quartic. Uh, in fact, I think it gets worse if, if I do something like, uh, oh, I may have had one of those sets of, hang on, hang on, let's do this properly. I've just noticed the C slider. Um, zero, zero, there we go. Okay, perfect, good. I think it gets worse if I do something like that and something like that. Yeah, things get a lot worse. If my quartic looks like this, there's nowhere to put the line. Somehow my formula goes quite wrong and the line goes over there. Um, there's something weird going on with my formula, which we might get to explore. But what I'm going to try and show you is a way to calculate that blue line that's tangent to the quartic in two places in the case that it exists. And then we can laugh at how my formula goes wrong in some cases. 
like that one. Okay. It's sort of a bit weird. If you put it in a case where it's not working, then it can sort of go round and back again. Let's play that one um, nice and slow. Um, so the formula is quite odd in some ways. Um, it gives you a line that's tangent to the cortic in two places if that exists, um, but my formula, if that line doesn't exist, gives you just sort of a random line that moves around and ends up in the right place, uh, ready for when that line exists again. Um, but its behaviour in between is quite weird. Um, cool. Yep. Yeah, so cortex where this line doesn't exist, totally there. Bit of a problem. Somehow my formula doesn't just give up. Provides me something. Right. Cool. We're going to work out that formula. Let's go. Um, there was a suggestion in chat from uh, suggestion in chat for how to find this. Uh, Jack said something about um, setting it equal and thinking about the derivative. I have an alternative method already to that. So this is a reaction that I saw uh, from other people who've tried this problem as well to say, oh, hang on. Oh, gosh. There we go. Let's get a nice picture again. There's a nice picture. Um, so I should solve some sort of simultaneous equations, right? Um, here's what I don't know. I don't know the gradient of the line, alpha. I don't know the y-intercept of the line, beta. I'd like to solve for those. Um, I have to solve for those. Um, yeah, please be nice in chat. Please be nice. Um, Prisma's moderating. Your chat messages are moderated. So you're just wasting your own time, I guess. Um, thank you, Prisma. Uh, OK, so we've got to solve for the gradient of the line, the y-intercept of the line. We also don't know where these two points of tangency are. So we've got four unknowns. If we're going to solve for all of those things, we need probably about four conditions. Let's try and write that down. This is uh, a suggestion from chat of how to make progress with this question. Uh, let's go. I've now set it up so I can use my graphics tablet down in the office. Let's see. Let's make the most of that. There we go. OK. And a line that's tangent in two places. Cool. And I don't know. This is like uh, x1 and this is like x2. But I don't know x1. I don't know x2. This is like y equals, uh, what was I calling this? Alpha x plus beta, um, let's say. And I don't know alpha. I don't know beta. I don't know x1, and I don't know x2, but I do know that the curve, I do know <laughs> that the curve looks like this: ax to the four plus bx cubed plus cx squared plus dx plus e. Gosh, hello SV. Uh, we've got a quartic, and we're trying to find a line that's tangent to it in two different places. Oh my goodness, what a weird graph! There's some sort of integer overflow. We were talking about integer overflows before we went live. Um, maybe there might be some complex numbers chat. Hold on, just in case some complex numbers turn up, then they might be playing some sort of secret role hiding in some square roots somewhere. Um, we've been playing around with some sliders and found that alpha and beta seem to be quite nice and real in my solution. Maybe x1 and x2 go super weird. Um, OK, let's see what we can do then. So one method is to say I want these points here to have the same value, same value at x1 and at x2, and also to have the same derivative at x1 and x2. That's a method that gives you four bits of information, um, four bits of information which maybe you could use to go and solve for alpha, beta, x1 and x2. Um, those are the four things that we don't know. We don't know where the tangent points should be. Um, they're not the minima. These are, I've drawn them a little bit closer to the minima in this picture, but I think we agree that they're not the minima it's slightly to one side of the minima in this picture. Um, OK, uh, so this is my quartic. This is my tangent. Um, we're going to call it a double tangent because it's, oh my goodness, a double tangent all the way across. There we go, OK. Um, good, right. Complex numbers may make an appearance if we get there. But between us and the complex numbers, there's a whole bunch of algebra to solve. Um, this method is quite complicated. Let's start writing it down just to see what it looks like. Um, so the same value expression looks like this. A1 x, a, a x1 to the 4 plus b x1 cubed plus c x1 squared plus d x1 plus e equals, is that supposed to be equal to a x1 plus b, alpha, yeah, x1 plus beta. And then we get a similar expression with x2s in it, and then we differentiate and we get another expression for the tangents to be equal to alpha. So that, that second one, the, the third and fourth equations there are not too bad because they're both equal to alpha for the derivative, um, but the, the first two are pretty nasty. Um, and it's a little bit awkward that we don't really care about the values of x1 and x2. If I just want to find this tangent, then I can, if I just want to find the tangent, I only really care about alpha and beta um, for, the, for, that, for that thing there. 
Um, so there's an alternative solution. Um, an alternative solution. Let's see if chat can come up with a different approach. Um, we could go through and like, turn, really turn the handle and try and solve simultaneous equations. Uh, but I'm going to put like wobbly face next to that. Oh, you can't see my wobbly face. Wobbly face next to that. Um, for this is a bit weird. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, Chat, can we have another idea? Oh, Ming, right. What does Ming say? Equate two equations and find out when there's only two solutions. Um, yeah, I like that. That seems good. Yeah. Um, people are talking about complex numbers now. Also, like somewhere between, somewhere with the two points between x1 and the local maximum and a point between the local maximum and x2. That's the same instant so in relatively close to the minimums. They are relatively close to the minimums. Quite hard to turn that into a sort of equation that helps us narrow down precisely what alpha and beta should be. Um, I like this idea about equating the two equating the two and looking for there being exactly two solutions. I think what Ming's thinking about is, in general, if you throw a line across this picture, um, in general, if your line looks something like this, then you might get kind of four points where it crosses the quartic, or you might get uh, just three if it, oh no, that's four again. Uh, in general, if you throw a line at this quartic, let's see if I can do this, come on. You, or you might get maybe three, or you might get two up here, or this is kind of special case where you get two if it's the double tangent, where you only get two solutions. Um, so maybe we can think about uh, finding the difference between these two curves and difference between these two curves and looking for two roots, exactly two roots. Uh, I'm going to write up that method over here. It's sometimes good to have a list of what your method actually is. Difference between the curves uh, has, has two roots. Cool. Okay. We could use the tangent equation and equate those as well. Yeah, so the tangent equation is quite bad. I don't really love it. It's like this. Um, 3b x1 squared plus 2c x1 plus d equals alpha. There, there are, then there's a second one with x2s in. That's also equal to alpha. But this equation is quite messy. I don't know. It just feels, it just feels quite... You know, maybe it is the true way to get in there and solve, solve this thing. I can sort of see that when you equate these two things, there'll be a factor of x1 minus x2 that we could subtract off, divide through by, sorry. So maybe that's good. I'm really struggling with words today. That's, that's going quite badly. Ah, oh, so they've both got a d in, they've both got an alpha in. Maybe this method's not terrible. Maybe this method's not terrible. Because then you do the, you do the difference and you get, um, you do the difference and you divide by x1 minus x2 because they're supposed to be different. Uh, x1, x2 plus x2 squared, is that how that works? Uh, chat, does that multiply by x1 minus x2 to give x1 cubed minus x2 cubed? Let me know in chat. I think I'm right. Uh, difference of two squares gives us something like this, and then this 2c over here. And that's just zero. And that looks suspiciously like a quadratic for x2 in terms of x1. So then we've eliminated one of the things we don't know. Go back to the original equation. Something like that. Something like that. Maybe. Yeah, go back to the original equation do the difference on those two as well. Um, and divide by x1 minus x2 again. Yeah, there's a method like this that probably works. Um, I did that way too fast because I just wanted to find out whether it would work or not. Um, sometimes on the Maths Club, I do something poorly and I tell you to go and do it better. Um, this is one of those times. Uh, I've explained this really badly, uh, but I reckon maybe you could make this work. This thing that people in chat really want to do, it seems, to take these two hideous equations, take the difference between them, well, we set them equal to each other and, and rearrange, and then maybe you can solve, maybe you can do some solving down there. This looks a little bit like a quadratic to me. Uh, maybe it's a good quadratic, I can't really tell. It's got A, B, and C in it. That's not, that's not nothing. Um, okay. Uh, the tangent equation is, yeah, okay. I think I'm catching up with chat. Yeah, tangent equation is pretty good. Um, yeah, so I like Jack's way of thinking here as well. Uh, 3b x1 minus x2. I've divided by x1 minus x2, so I think it should be x1 plus x2. I think. Almost. Am I almost correct? <laughs> Am I almost correct on this one? x1 cubed minus xt, x1 squared. Oh, that's the worst thing anyone could say in chat. It's just, just the word almost. That's all my existential crisis all at once. It's something like that, isn't it? Okay, right, I'm, I'm getting away with this. Right, cool. Um, homework, if you like, uh, fix the mistake on screen that I can't find, if there is one, and also make this method work. Um, meantime, I'm going to go make this other method work, um, suggested by Ming in chat, so credit to Ming. 
Uh, here goes. Uh, this method says that we should look for the difference between the two curves, which is this quartic. This bit's tricky. D minus alpha x plus E minus beta. Now we want this quartic. Let's put it there. Okay. We want this quartic to have exactly two roots. Um, it's a bit unusual for a quartic to have exactly two roots. Um, Jack says something interesting in chat. Actually, we know more than it just just having two random roots, like um, like a quartic. <laughs> Quartics have two roots in two different ways. Um, some quartics have two roots because they look like this, and some quartics have two roots because they look like this, with like these two repeated roots. And um, we um, we know that we we actually want this sort. We want this sort with two repeated roots. So you can put this word repeated in here. Cool. Um, this is weird. We're doing a lot of weird stuff. We're trying our best to do like the hardest algebra that we can possibly do. Um, all moths. <laughs> good, good, good. OK. Um, said differently. Let's, let's look at the picture again and, and say this differently. I'm still learning how to move around in Myra. There we go. Um, said differently. Um, if you tilt the if you tilt your, tilt your head a little bit and look at the original picture, the quartic has kind of two different repeated roots when it's compared against the pink line, the double tangent. If that pink line were horizontal, then this would be you know, a classic picture of a quartic that's W-shaped and has two turning points uh, down at the bottom on the x-axis, two different repeated roots. We know quite a lot about repeated roots. I mean, we know they have zero derivatives, so if you want to talk about derivatives, you could do that. Um, but we know about roots of polynomials. Almost, I think we know more about roots of polynomials than, than we do about derivatives. At A level, we're talking about derivatives anyway. Um, so the difference between two curves, I just mean take the express the equation for, the, for this one at the top and subtract the equation for the second one. Um, I'm calling them both curves, even though one of them is very curvy and one of them is a straight line. Sorry. Uh, difference between two curves, difference between these two functions. Um, we want that to be zero where they meet each other, but more than that, we want that to be a repeated root. Um, this is actually a strategy for finding tangents in general, that the tangent to a quadratic has this kind of property that if you take the difference between the quadratic and that straight line, then the expression you end up with has a repeated root at the point of tangency. Um, it sort of has to because after you've done the difference, you've brought that point down to the x-axis and the rest of the curve is above the x-axis so you've got this thing that comes down to the x-axis and goes back up again so it's a quadratic after you've done the subtraction it's got something something at zero over there and then it goes back up again that's a repeated root um, if you don't believe me take your favorite quadratic no weird quartic stuff take your favorite quadratic choose a point on it um, find the tangent to that point and then do quadratic minus tangent and you'll find that you end up with a new quadratic that has a repeated root at the point of tangency there. Um, ooh, can you do something with Pythagoras to create the excesses? Yes, yeah, so some people want to do like think about theta, I guess, and try and move it down, something like that. Um, in fact, this um, this translation of well, not translation, but this uh, transformation where you subtract ax plus beta, alpha x plus beta. Really struggling with my Greek letters today. Um, this is not something you learn at A level, but doing this sort of translation of f of x plus or minus, I suppose, f of x minus alpha x minus beta, that's called a shear. Um, so shears uh, work like this. Um, they move uh, layers parallel to each other um, in a way that depends on how far, other, how far apart the layers are. Um, like if you uh, rub your hands together, like I'm not quite doing, like if you rub your hands together, that's kind of shear. Um, doing that sort of transformation on a graph where it transforms, for example, rectangles that are lined up with the axes, rectangles get transformed to parallelograms, squares get transformed to parallelograms, um, and things move kind of, move in directions parallel to each other, but 
with more motion further away from the line that doesn't move. That's what shears do. Uh, they have this format of shifting, not just by a constant, by, by an amount that depends on x. Or if you like, you can shift this way, um, and shifting this way uh, gives you a, a shear that depends on y. Uh, so maybe there's a line in the middle that's not moving, but then above and below that, the lines are moving, uh, the shear with respect to y. And this gives you a new way to convert between um, functions and dance moves. Um, so if you want to convert dance moves into functions and functions into dance moves, uh, then you can use shears to achieve that. Sorry, I saw a very good t-shirt at the open day. Somebody had a t-shirt that had uh, different dance moves and functions on it as well. Okay, uh, shears, matrices, matrices for representing shears. Good idea. If you know about matrices, then you will see this again. Um, it's a bit like... Uh... Anyway, never mind. Cool, right. We're doing a shear transformation. Or if you prefer, we're finding the difference between these two curves. And once we've done that, we'll end up with a quartic that has two repeated roots, like this one on the right. Let's put this back on the screen. This is pretty powerful because now we know um, that this expression must now be a times x minus x1 squared times x minus x2 squared. Um, this is pretty powerful stuff um, because we know all of the roots of this quartic. It's a degree 4 polynomial, so it can only have four roots counted with multiplicity, counted with repeated, repeated roots counting more than once. Um, and we found all of them. We found that, ah, we've convinced ourselves it has one repeated root at x1 and another repeated root at x2. Um, so that's all of the roots. Here they are. Here's the one at x1 that's repeated, and here's the one at x2 that's repeated. Um, you can't see my mouse. <laughs> here's the one at x1 that's repeated. Here's the one at x2 that's repeated. Um, and overall, those, that's where the roots are. I put this factor of a in to match the leading coefficient, match the top coefficient. Uh, you have to worry about this a little bit when you factorise polynomials, right? When you factorise polynomials, um, something like that might happen. That's a good quadratic, Kai. Um, minus x squared, Whoa. x squared minus 4. It's like a smiley face, but down a little bit. Good, cool, right, good, okay. Uh, and it goes through 2, 2, so that's nice, good, right. Uh, I will rank quadratics in chat. x squared minus x minus 1, something to do with the golden ratio. Very nice. Good choice, Kai. Um, okay, right. Um, what am I doing? Um, I've tried to convince you that this horrible expression up here, after you've done this shear, to look at the difference between the, the quadratic and the double tangent line, is really nice. It's got a really nice expression. It must have a really nice expression because it's tangent at, at two, because it's um, got two repeated roots. So it must look like this. Um, cool, okay. Um, how did I factor that? Um, based on my knowledge of what the roots have to be. Um, I know that there's a repeated root at x1 and I know there's a repeated root at x2. Um, so it has to factorise like this. Um, so this is based on, based on knowledge of where the roots are. I'm going to put all the roots are. This is pretty amazing because we can compare these between each other. Um, we could, if we wanted to, multiply this one out. As a consequence, x1, x, x2, x plus x2 squared. Um, that must be equal to the original expression we had. Now we're off to, off to the races. x squared minus 2 equals 0. It's pretty good. Oh, it's got um, it's something to do with root 2, which is a good irrational number. Oh, parallel circle to y equals sine 1 over. That is a good function. That's a very good function. Yeah, maybe I should have divided 3 by a on the initial quartic. This is a really good suggestion over here. Yeah, to get rid of the a's to start off with. I think I set a to be 1 in the Desmos plot, so maybe I could drop all of the a's. If you drop all of the a's, capital A's, then everything's much simpler. You don't have to argue about this leading coefficient thing, it just becomes more obvious. Very good idea, probably too late for me now, if we had that idea half an hour ago. <laughs> when you redo this for homework, you can drop out all of the capital A's, which divide through, it'll be much nicer. Don't forget to multiply up again afterwards. That's like using a graph transformation of squashing, uh, squashing parallel to the y-axis. Um, fun times. Right, okay, what am I doing? Um, you can compare coefficients 
between these two expressions. If you compare coefficients between these two expressions, then you get some lovely relationships that tell you about, crucially, what alpha and beta are in terms of x1 and x2 and in terms of uh, the, other, the other ones there as well. Uh, will there be further reading? Maybe. Um, I haven't done further reading for a little bit because I've been busy with unique and open days and things like that. Um, I really want to show you my Desmos code, so maybe there will be, will be further reading. And I have mentioned list issue curves, so there's something to go into further reading. Um, okay, let's start doing this. I've got 20 minutes on the clock to try and speed run through this algebra. I think I can do it. I think this method's better than the other one. If anybody's playing along at home, and they've been trying to get the other method to work, where you go and solve this thing, I'm now going to race you. Um, <laughs> if you're trying this at home, off you go. Um, I'm going to try and get this method out uh, by comparing coefficients on my lovely factorised expression. Right, let's go. Okay, so top coefficient is a, because I made sure that it was a. The next one down is the x cubed coefficient. So on the left, that's a times. Here we go. I'm going to do some multiplying out. Um, I don't know how your day is going, but my day is going in a very multiplying out sort of way. That must be equal to b, comparing the coefficients of x cubed. Uh, next, I can look at the coefficients of x squared. The coefficients of x squared are a little bit harder to work out. I think they are a x2 squared. I can see an a x1 squared. I really should have divided through by a at some point. Is it too late to divide through by a? Mm, maybe it's not too late to divide through by a. Let's think about dividing through by a. That's a very good suggestion. I'm going to steal the suggestion of dividing through by a. Okay, coefficient of x squared. I can see an x1 squared, an x2 squared, and also a 4x1, x2. Okay, that gives me something to do with c. Look, I can divide this one by a as well. Oh, was it an anonymous person who said divide 3 by a? Oh. Uh, literature curves were related to, not really, they're related to messing around with Desmos. Uh, when we were in Desmos, I tried to turn on different sliders, and there's something going on there that's a little bit like literature curves, but I'll stick in the further reading if I remember to write any further reading. Okay, um, this gives expressions for b and c in terms of x1 and x2. Um, I don't totally care about um, b or c or x1 and or x2 in terms of each other. What I really care about is alpha and beta. So I'm going to write down those ones as well. I'm going to write down coefficients for, gosh, where did I get to? x next, I think, which is minus 2 x1 x2 squared minus 2, is the end in sight? x2 x1 squared. That's supposed to be d minus alpha all over a. Okay, um, so actually something quite nice is going on here. Um, for example, here, look, so what I want is this combination of x1s and x2s. I don't really care about the numbers x1 and x2, um, but what I really want is alpha, which I can see is buried inside here on the right-hand side, um, over here. Um, what I really want is that alpha, um, and I've got on the left some stuff to do with x1s and x2s. Um, ha! Ha! So, let's try and avoid heavy algebra. Someone in chat. Um, avoiding heavy algebra. Yeah, so SV, we did a, did a shear to get it down into a format where something was equal to zero. Something was equal to zero because we subtracted alpha x and we subtracted a piece to get it to go zero. Wrote down this factorized form. And now I'm comparing coefficients. I've got two different expressions for the same curve. Comparing coefficients. This is my x cubed coefficient. This is my x squared coefficient. This is my x coefficient. I need to think about the coefficient of ones as well. Uh, which I think is x1 squared, x2 squared, is equal to e minus beta over a. Dividing through by a was a really good idea. Thank you, person who suggested that. Um, cool, right. Um, let's try rearranging these. So I'm going to try and pro progress through this without actually solving for x1 and x2 because I don't really care about x1 and x2. Um, if, you can, if you can do something like that, then you get to save yourself quite a lot of work um, because... You avoid solving for things you don't care about. So what I've shown you so far is some sort of weird trick to write down a factorised form of the quadratic um, based on our knowledge of where the roots are. And now this is the bit where it should pay off. Um, I'm seriously hoping that it pays off at some point soon, right? Um, because we had to have an idea and do something a little bit strange. Um, and now should be the time when it all comes together. I'm just rearranging things to try and tidy them up a little bit to try and make them look a little bit more friendly. I'm trying to spot links between them so that when it comes down to actually sort of solving, like I'm going to factorise this one just to see what it looks like. Um, uh, I think it's like this, isn't it? Um, I'm, I'm moving around factors of 
factors of minus signs and twos just to tidy things up. Um, because look, now I can see that alpha, something I care about, is related to x1 plus x2. And I know x1, x1 plus x2. Without solving for x1 or x2, I know it in terms of b's and a's. So I can take all of this stuff, plug it in here. Brilliant stuff. Um, I'm trying to avoid working out what x1 and x2 actually are. Okay. Um, I need, also in this expression, I need x1, x2. Can I see one of those? Yes, I can see one of those. I can see one of those in this expression for c. Um, this expression also comes with an x1 squared and an x2 squared. Um, so maybe I should try making something to do with x1 and x2 squared out of the top thing. Um, here's my plan. I'm going to move to the right a little bit here because I'm going underneath chat. Solving these. I really want alpha. I don't care about x1 and x2, where these points are. I just care about the line. Um, so I've got this minus b over 2a to go in here. x1, x2, uh, my trick that I think I want to use here is to square the first one. If I square that first equation, I'm sort of desperately avoiding solving for x1 and x2. I get this quadratic expression, um, and then I can take the difference. to so say that 2x1, x2 is equal to c over a uh, minus b squared over 4a squared, um, which is pretty good. It's not a bad expression at all. In fact, it's a little bit familiar, isn't it? It's b squared minus 4ac over 4a squared. That's almost with a minus sign. That's almost, almost like I should have spotted that before. I think someone said b squared minus 4ac in chat a little while ago. Um, never mind. Right, good. Uh, so let's put that in here as well. So in here, I end up with, um, let's put, yeah, use the minus sign into the fraction. Uh, this is going to be x plus 1, which I think is minus b over 2a. Um, and this other term here, this x1, x2, is going to be something like uh, minus times minus b squared minus 4ac. There are a couple of minus signs here that are going to cancel out. Let's just get rid of them now. Uh, and then don't forget to divide by 2, a squared. So 16a cubed on the bottom, a nice expression on the top. Uh, multiply through by 2a, like that. Um, and I'm going to end up with alpha is equal to like d plus b, b squared minus 4ac over 8a squared. And then just to finish up, so that's alpha, the thing I wanted in the line, but avo avoiding doing any of the algebra for x1 and x2. Just to finish up the calculation, I also want beta. Um, beta is going to be a little bit easier to work out. Um, so beta, let's try, if I zoom slightly out of it, beta over here, um, it's in terms of x1, x2 like this, um, but I've now decided that I know x1, x2. Um, so I know that x1, x2 is um, b squared minus 4ac over 4a squared. Um, but I want to square that and divide by 4 uh, to get rid of this factor of 2 over on the right-hand side. I'm using an expression all the way from out of town over there, all the way back in over here. And um, that's going to be equal to e minus beta over a. Um, so then rearrange that for beta as well. Um, cool, yep, turns out to involve b squared minus 4ac, but... Mm, also a bunch of other stuff going on as well for what alpha and beta are. Um, I really like this method because you get to do something slightly clever to say, aha, um, I'm going to take the difference between the curves and then talk about the difference between curves as its own function. Um, this difference between the two curves is kind of a quartic because it's still a quartic after I've done this subtraction over here. Um, it's still a, still a quartic. Um, but I know where all its roots are now because that line is supposed to be tangent in two different places. Um, so I can write down this nice factorization and then compare coefficients. And comparing the coefficients means that I can avoid solving for x1 and x2. Um, uh, is somebody writing a poem for the Python statement? I'm sort of keeping up with what Prisma is saying in chat. Ah, the expression with e is a bit easier. Sorry, checking chat again. I didn't say there's no account for what type of school. I said, anyway. Except we didn't have hard cutoffs for different different types of school on maths. I, I remember what I said. Right, cool. Um, that gives us some expressions for alpha and beta, um, which are the expressions that I had in Desmos. Ta-da! Oh, ta-da! <laughs> there we go. Um, way down here. I've got some expressions hiding all the way down here. Here they go. Here they, here they come. Um, more or less this, right? Um, so these are my expressions. Um, and they do give a curve that a line that's tangent in two different places. Um, and hopefully, if you do the question do the question the other way, where you use the fact that you don't know x1, x2, alpha, or beta, but you go and solve the four simultaneous equations using the things we talked about over on the left up here, 
and then hopefully you get down to the same solution. Now side effects, because I avoided solving for x1 and x2, um, because I avoided solving for x1 and x2, um, I haven't noticed that sometimes the quartic doesn't have any points where the line is tangent in two places. So what's going on in this case is my expressions for alpha and beta still work, but um, my expressions for alpha and beta still work, but x1 and x2, which I didn't solve for in my method, have become complex numbers. Um, so I suppose my claim is that this line is tangent to the curve in two places, but the places live in the complex plane. And we can't see them because we're only looking at real inputs for our qu quartic. Uh, everything would be much nicer if we imagined the quartic living in, uh, in the complex world, taking complex inputs and the complex output outputs, in which case my answer would be algebraically correct. Uh, when you multiply by 2a, I'm not sure you did it to all the terms, so that sounds pretty likely. Again, this might be another moment. Zoom all the way out. Multiply by 2a. Oh yeah, all this was multiplied together. I can see how that looks rubbish. It's all multiplied together. I got away with it, I think, because these are these are these um these brackets are all multi these things are all multiplied together. So these things, although they're very far apart, they are they are all multiplied together. There was a big minus sign in there that I crossed out. Yeah, I think I got away with it. This thing's also in here as the x one x two. Right, good, good catch. Uh, given two points, can you create a quartic which has the line tangent at those two points? That is a fantastic question. Uh, given two points, can you find? The quartic, which is tangent to those two points. So the answer is yes. Um, and here's how. It's a good question. It's a related question. So we're going to do it now. Also because we've got uh, some time. Uh, and then we're going to put it into Desmos. That is the plan. OK, we're going to do that question next. Um, yeah, limits of 3D vision. 3D vision stops you from doing loads of cool stuff to do with um, complex numbers. It's a shame complex numbers are so good, right? Because they really, you just really want four dimensions to view your complex input and your complex output, but we, can, we can't do that. Um, right, okay, we're now going to devote some of the live stream to a question that an anonymous person has asked. Given two points, can you create a quartic that has the line tangent at those two points? I've just reread the question and realised that it's harder than I thought, so I'm going to panic very slightly. The answer is still yes, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's still yes. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I've drawn the things in the wrong colours, but I know what I'm doing. Different question. Um, overflow large numbers again. Yeah. Show zero. 10 to the 26. Oh, do we think it's not supposed to be that? Because it's not the sign of if Desmos. If Desmos unable to handle large numbers, maybe. Okay, anyway. Um, so, request from chat. They give me two points. I give them a quartic that has a line that's tangent at both of those points, please. Um, here's my plan. I'm going to look at their points, x1, y1, and x2, y2. I think my plan is to subtract. I'll go and work out the line y equals mx plus c that goes through both of these points. What is that line? It's like y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, x minus x1 plus y1. Something like that, so that when I put an x2, I get y2, and when I put an x1, I get y1. Um, I'm going to subtract that line from the quadratic, the quartic that I haven't solved for yet. Um, so I've got my quartic, which I'm going to call like p of x or something mad, um, from p of x. Um, and then I'm going to write down the quartic. So now, now after subtracting that, I'm now looking for the challenge is to find a quartic that has repeated roots. At x1 and x2. That's what they want. Cool. Okay. Prisma, I think you might have replied to a message that isn't in chat. Maybe. Or maybe not. Maybe there's a while ago. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, cool. Right, so x1 over here, x2 over here. And I can write down a quartic that does that. I can write down this quartic. Um, this quartic is has repeated roots there at x1 and x2. Um, so that's all great. And then I'm going to add back on, add the line back. 
So I think I can add back on the line, add back on the line yt minus y1 over x2 minus x1, x minus x1 plus y1. Okay, that's my sort of plan. Um, and I think it works because when you put an x1, you'll get zero on this first term, so you get the right value. And the tangent, the gradient of this thing is zero at x1, but it has the correct gradient over there. So I think this is all good. Let's stick it in Desmos and see if we can make it work. Uh, 10 minutes on the clock. Speed run. Uh, Desmos is over there. Right, cool. I need a new one. Quick uh, Desmos break. There we go. Uh, right, okay. So plan is they're going to give me curves x1, uh, y1. Points x1, x uh, y1. And points y1, y2. Ugh, that's not how curves work. x2, y2. There we go. That seems more sensible like that. Cool. Um, uh, so we've got our two points. And my challenge is to write down a quartic that has. Um, well, not that yet. That has is tangent tangent to the line that goes through those two points. So the the double tangent to the quartic is plus is ta the double tangent to the quartic is double tangent at those two points. Goodness me, this is much harder to explain. I think I should just do it and hopefully get it right. Plus y one right. Oh, where's that minima? I've accidentally put the minima in. No, I think I'm safe. I think I'm good. I think I did it. I think I did it. Let's draw the line in as well, just to be super clear. Now doing the speed, Desmos. Hang on, tidy it up a little bit. Bring these to the top. Get the sliders. Fix the colours. Uh, what do I want? Blue for this. Red for the cubic. Blue for the tangent. Up the line thickness. Now just messing around really. Good, good, good. Right, cool. Now hopefully this is double tangent. There we go. I can move the points around and get a quartic that is double tangent at the two requested points. Yeah, there we go. So this is quite interesting because now I can put the points nice and steep like that. I can see that the quartic in there is really close to the line in between. It's kind of moving around. It doesn't uniquely define the quartic because I can put in a factor in here of like two or three if I want to. Uh, it doesn't uniquely define the quartic. So how do you want to set that other point? You could, I suppose, ask me, you get one sort of degree of freedom, one degree of freedom left over, I think, for how violent you want your quartic to grow far away. Cool, very good question in chat. Thank you very much. I'm pleased we managed to solve it. And also because Desmos lets you do, um, once you've got sliders on your points, you can move them around like this. Very nice. I actually think I prefer this to the um, version I showed you at the start. Lovely. Anything else going on? Cool. Um, chat's gone a little bit funny for me. <laughs> I can see Prisma's comments, but I can't see everyone else's comments. Is chat working for everyone else? Um, good. Um, what is chat doing? Turn it off and on again? Why can I only see Prisma's messages? What's going on? Maybe it's only Prisma's messages in chat right now. Cool, right, okay. <laughs> Maybe that's just working. Um, I like this problem. Um, so are there problems that you could try if this one's um, too easy? Let's put, so if the lines look, if the lines have the same Y value, then that straight line is just constant. So the quartic is nice. Changing the number out here doesn't really change very much. Um, moving the points around just applies a kind of shear transformation. There's a shear happening. So shearing the, the curve up and down. Um, it's maybe the next most complicated transformation after the ones that you learn about at A level. So at A level you learn about translations and stretches. I think a shear is maybe the the next most complicated thing that you can imagine. It means adding, in this case, adding to a function, some sort of straight line. Um, what if we use a quintic instead? What does that get us? Um, yeah, great question. What do quintics look like? Um, so quintics look a bit different, don't they? Quintics can go, um, quintics can have several turning points. 
I think you can only have a line that's tangent to it twice, though. I don't think you can have a line that's tangent to a quintic in three different places. I think you need a polynomial of degree six in order to get that. Um, oh, Prisma's typing. Right, got it. Prisma's typing, and then the questions appear afterwards. Oh, uh, right, cool. Good. I see. Further chat, 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 where it actually was. So I need to go back in time to okay, right. see chat messages. Okay, cool. Right. Gotcha. Good times. Maybe I can do something here as well. Um, yeah, maybe I can help as well. Okay, cool. Um, really quick Q&A. Um, I was going to show you another problem. Um, no, actually, let's do this. Um, so Casey sent me an email that I really liked. Um, this is the show and tell part of the live stream. Uh, we did this an entire live stream like this last week. Um, show and tell really quickly. Um, and before that with Ali's uh, card trick on a couple of weeks ago. Um, so welcome back to the corner of the live stream where we talk about stuff that people have sent in. Um, a couple of weeks ago, or was it last week? Last week we talked about a problem with the shadow behind a planet. Um, so we talked about a planet where there was some light source that was really far away. Um, and we talked about how you could look at the shadow behind that and talk about the shadow behind, let's try and sketch this again, and look at the shadow behind that, and then think about some satellite that's orbiting around the planet. Um, the satellite's orbiting around on some circular orbit around, and you could think about this distance over here for the time that your satellite is in shadow. Um, and I suggested on the live stream that, well, we did the problem on the live stream. Um, I think Finley wrote in with this originally. Um, did the problem on the live stream. It's really nice. You can throw in some Kepler's law stuff to convert that distance into a time. Uh, the time depend. The time depends on radius in a quite, uh, quite unusual way. Um, I suggested on the live stream that a very difficult problem would be to have the sun not infinitely far away, but to have the sun somewhere like here, not to scale. So now the shadow is some more complicated region behind the planet, um, like this. Uh, that's maybe harder to work with. I suggested on the live stream that this was a much harder problem. And of course, that meant that I got an email about a week later uh, telling me the solution to this problem. Um, and the solution is lovely. Um, essentially, what's going on, let's draw some sort of teal lines on here. Um, what's going on is that Moving the sun to be over here instead of infinitely far away means that these two radii that go out to the ten points of tangency where the sun's rays are going past the planet, they're no longer a diameter. Before, that was a diameter across the middle of the sun, of uh, middle of the planet, but now these two lines are no longer a diameter. Um, instead, if we mark in this angle over here as something like phi or something, then this angle over here is now pi minus phi. It's pi minus phi because there's a bunch of right angles around on this quadrilateral. Um, so because it's pi minus phi, that means that the bit over on this side, where we'd already worked out these angles, theta, because we had to last time to do the, the case with the, the, parallel, the parallel rays, means that this angle over here has just been increased um, increased relative to the parallel problem by an amount phi. Um, so this bit in, bet in between, it used to be pi minus 2 theta, but now it's pi minus 2 theta plus phi. I mean, that's the angle we care about because that's the angle on this purple, on this purple circle for how much, how much of that radius of the purple circle for the satellite is contained in the shadow. Let's draw the satellite in again. There it goes, around, around the planet. Um, how much of the how much of the distance is in shadow? Um, so it's actually really nice um, if you have the sun close enough that it close enough that it subtends an angle um, phi um, when you look at the at the planet. I suppose the planet takes up an angle of phi of the sky when looked at from the sun, and um, then that just changes the angle calculation by an amount phi, um, and that's really nice because it it just changes the final answer just a little bit. Um, the rest of the maths about Kepler's law and the conversion between time and velocity and distance is all the same. Um, so I really like that. It's the second time in recent weeks that I've suggested on the live stream that something is really complicated and difficult, and then somebody's written in to say, actually, no, 
I've done that. Um, and I'll note that, to finish, I'll note that today I've suggested that this method over here is really complicated and difficult. Um, and maybe that's a challenge to chat. Am I going to get an email of somebody telling me that they've got this method to work and it was easy? Um, good. Right. Okay. I think I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, thanks for goodness me. We did a lot of algebra today, didn't we? And I think we did the method with less algebra in it because we avoided solving for x1 and x2. Um, goodness me. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to leave it there. That's probably enough algebra for one day. Um, I think I'm going to hang out in chat for a little bit. Um, so if you're in chat, I'll come, come and say hi in chat. Um, other than that, we'll see you next week for one more episode in this season of the Oxford Online Maths Club. Um, great to see you. Have a wonderful day if it's sunny where you are or even if it's not. Um, and we'll see you next week for the Oxford Online Maths Club. How do I turn the stream off? How do I turn the stream off? Bye, Harriet. Bye, Prisma. <laughs> is this your... This, yeah, this is... This would be a wallpaper, right? Just the whole math club live stream. Oh, I should have been taking like the whole math club. Whole math club. And then just, oh, I could put that on my wall. Oh, just kidding. This is already what my walls look like at home. Just scribbled algebra all over the place like a crazy person. Oh. But if you want your walls to look like that too, then take your screenshots now. <laughs> oh, chat. Oh, chat. Right. Maybe they didn't mean house wallpaper. Maybe they meant foam wallpaper. Goodness me. Right, cool. I'm going to hang out and chat for a minute. Uh, I'll see you over there. Take care. See you next week. Bye.